We're looking at the last section of Romans, and it's a topic that we desperately need to understand. But as we said in the beginning of our study of Romans, there are other things we have to understand in order to truly understand service. We first had to understand that we were sinners. So we couldn't do anything for the Lord in the condition that we were in. We needed a savior and he brought salvation. And not only did he bring salvation, he's working sanctification in our lives. And he does that through his sovereignty. It's not according to our plan. It's not what we want God doing in our lives. It's what God wants to do in our lives. And we're to submit to that plan so that he can make of us the men and the women that he wants us to be so that then and only then, we can serve him as we should. And we first looked at our relationship with the Lord as it pertained to service. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's, it's what we ought to be doing. It's not the extraordinary. It should be the ordinary. And then we looked at our relationship within the body. We're members one of another. We're uniquely different than one another, but we, we are part of the body, Christ being the head of that body. And we discussed our relationship with one another and our service to one another. And in this final section of Romans, we're going to look at our relationship with the world. Potential enemies within that world. And Lord willing, the next time we gather, we're going to look at our relationship with to the state. Mm, yeah. That's going to be an interesting one. Mm. The title of our study today is Rules of Engagement. Rules of Engagement. When Jesus saved me, he didn't just rapture me at that moment and take me to heaven with him. He left me here for a purpose for his purpose. And so when we think about service as it pertains to the world, we need to understand the rules of engagement. Those that are laid out by our commander in chief. Not the ones that we lay out. I just want to warn you this morning that this message, these verses go contrary to our nature. They're contrary to our nature. They are not things that come natural to us. They are supernatural. And the only way we're going to function in the supernatural is if we spend time with the one who is super natural, the Lord. And we're filled with his spirit so that we can walk in his love and bear the fruit that is his Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith, all of those things that are part of his nature. So we left off in our study in verse 14. That's where we're going to pick up this morning. And the first thing we're going to look at in the rules of engagement, we need to manage their moods. We need to manage their moods. The problem this morning is the church is following the mood of the world. We're engaged with the world. We listen to the world. We're being conformed to the world. The world tells us what is acceptable and what is not. The world tells us what is moral and what is not. The world tells us what we should be angry about. The world tells us what we should be anxious about. The world tells us what we should be involved in. We're to manage the moods of the world, not the other way around. Unfortunately, that's what's happening. The, the world is dictating to the church today. And the church is being a puppet to the world. And unbeknownst to her, apparently, there's a puppet master behind the world. The God of this age. We must never forget the God of this age, the God of the world that's manipulating the world. And if we're being swayed by the world, guess who we're ultimately being swayed by? 
So we need to learn this morning the rules of engagement. And the first thing that we need to understand is we're to manage their moods. Look at verse 14. It says, bless them which persecute you. And just in case you missed it, he says, bless and curse not. Bless them that persecute you. The first thing we're to do is to disarm the opposition. We disarm the opposition. We don't stoop to their level. Here's something that's interesting about that word bless in the Greek. It's where we get our English word eulogize. Where you speak well of someone. So the Lord says, speak well of those that persecute you. I told you it was going to get a little uh, uncomfortable here. It's, it's contrary to our nature. The church is wanting to fight back this morning. The church is trying to take back this morning. The church is trying to claim stuff this morning that the head never gave to her. And she's in the process rejected what he has given to her. He has granted her a kingdom, but she's not interested in that kingdom this morning. She's interested in that kingdom this morning. And she's not managing the moods out there. She's being manipulated by those moods. Bless Bless, bless them that persecute you. Could we just, we just, we just sit here for the rest of our time until time to leave and, and just let that sink in. But there's, there's a lot more. We're, we're, we're going to go, we're going to go deeper. Bless them. In Proverbs 15, verse one says this, a soft answer turneth away wrath. A soft answer turneth away wrath. You don't have to yell at the person yelling at you. I was scrolling through Facebook. I told you a while back to pray for your pastor because he likes UFC and, and fighting and that kind of thing. But I was watching this lead up to the latest UFC thing. And there was two guys that are going to be fighting. They're sitting up at the table and they're acting like two little children on the playground, name calling one another. And I know a lot of it's for the show and that kind of thing, but it was just, it just kind of turned me off. I was just, whatever, just get in the ring, man, and settle it that way, right? I don't want to hear all that. Hey, I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? You know, I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. And you know that your mama, you know, all of those kind of things, right? Bless those that persecute you. Bless those that persecute you. A soft answer turns away wrath. We are to disarm the opposition with what we say and how we say it in Colossians chapter 4. Let your words always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. If you don't like that one, Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the hope that you have in Christ. Bless them that persecute you. We're being persecuted in America and we're going to bless them. That's what we're going to do. We're going to bless them. That's what we're going to do when they persecute. We're going to bless well, maybe some of us, some of you are like, ah, you're going to have to preach a little bit better than that to convince me, pastor. Bless those that persecute you. Bless, he repeats it, and curse not. Do you know that James, talking about our tongue in chapter 3 says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. He says, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, and then he says, Brethren, these things ought not to be. The Lord is telling me I don't come in here on Sunday and say, I'm falling in love, falling in love with you. And I'm out there, you sorry scoundrel Democrat. 
You sorry scoundrel Republican. You no good for nothing news media. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and curse not. We should disarm the opposition. We don't stoop to their level and play their games. They do that because they don't have an answer, church. They call you names. They get mad. They stomp and scream and do all. You, you've seen it on the net. And then we as the church start that foolishness. Can we get some adults in the house? Can we get some folks that would act like Jesus? Do you think Jesus would go on the news and get in a back and forth foolishly with some fool? But the church does it all the time. I've done it. Get on social media. Oh yeah, look at me. I'm big, bad, and tough, ain't I? Bless those that persecute you. Bless them. Mm. Hmm. We are studying this morning the very depths of Jesus Christ. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. So, to manage their moods, we are to disarm the opposition. But we're also, we're also to discover opportunities. We're not discovering opportunities in the church because, because we're fighting the opposition. Do you know that we don't war against flesh and bl blood, Ephesians 6, but against principalities and powers? The Democrats are not your problem, Republican. And the Republicans are not your problem, Democrat. This colored person is not your problem, that colored person. And that colored person is not your problem, this colored person. The Baptist is not your problem, Pentecostal. And the Pentecostal is not your problem, Mr. Miss Baptist. Oh, but that's what we think. That's how we live. That's how we act. That's not how disciples of Christ act. But that's how we act. Oh, boy. <laughs> Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are to disarm the opposition and to discover opportunities. We, we discussed at the end of our study last week that we are to be given to hospitality. That is literally the love of strangers. And in Hebrews, we're told, be careful how we entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unaware. And we left off with this idea that every encounter you have with another human being is a divine appointment. You think it's accidental. It's not accidental. If you are a child of God, the steps of a good man are order the Lord. And so if you find yourself in the presence of another, discover the opportunity. And here's the easiest way you can do that, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, conservative, independent, whether you're black, white, red, yellow, brown, or whatever I am, we have things in common. That's why we saw Jesus do things like spend time at funerals. And weddings and banquets and dinners because he was discovering opportunities. He was, he was there to see how he could connect with another human being. But see, we're not into people, are we? No. The church is not into people, we're into principles, we're into programs. We're into plans. Those are the things we're into. 
And as a result, we confuse ourselves with those people who are around us, thinking that those people are around us are for us. But those people are not for us. They're for what we're for. Or they're against what we're against. But to them, it's not about people. It's about the plan or the principle or the program or the purpose. Let me just tell you this morning or remind you that God is for people. He's not fighting for a plan or a purpose or a program or principle. He's already got those. He is those. God is about people. But we can't see a person because we get hung up on what color their skin is. We don't see people as soon as we have a little spiritual conversation with them and realize that they worship different than we do. Because they think Jesus is coming back at a different time that we think Jesus is coming back. Or how you're going to be baptized. Sprinkled or dunked or sunk or whatever. Rejoice with those who rejoice. We don't even stop long enough to be happy for someone. I got to go to a beautiful wedding yesterday and it was just, it was just joyful to just sit back and enjoy their, their moment, their moment, not my moment, their moment. It was their day. It was their moment. And we all rejoiced with them. It was a beautiful thing. It was a wonderful experience. And to weep with those that weep. That's what Jesus did because Jesus knew his plan. He didn't have to argue his plan like we do. We are, I think we argue our plans because we're not convinced of our plans. We're still trying to prove them. He knew his plan. He knew his principles. He knew his purpose. And that's why he was able to serve people. We talked about that at the beginning of Romans 12 and John 13, where Jesus takes his garment off, girds himself with a towel, fills up a basin with water. He was able to do that because he knew the father had given all things to him and knew his time had come. He knew he came from the father. He was going to the father. He was convinced of those things. He didn't have to spend all of his waking moments clearly defining conservatism or clearly defining being uh, independent or a libertarian or a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever. He knew who he was. I would encourage you, get to know who you are in Christ quick so you can be about God's business because that's people. That's people. That's me. That's, that's those that are sitting around. You know, the, some of them, people that you don't like. You don't like. You don't like the way they look or maybe the way they smell or the way they dress. But those are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Can we? Can we? Could we? Should we? Yes, we should. Feel what someone else feels. Do we have the time to empathize with another human being? Are we so caught up in me? Are we so caught up in us? That's how we are to manage the mood out there. We manage the mood by disarming the opposition. Bless you, brother. You're a holy rolling weirdo. Thank you. <laughs> you have a good day, sir. God bless you. He loves you. You, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven? Do you remember what Jesus said? You don't know what spirit you are of. I'd let that one sink in for a little bit. What spirit? What spirit? What, 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 he ain't talking about the Holy Spirit. So we're to, we're to manage the mood by disarming the opposition, by discovering opportunities. Jesus just went about among people looking for opportunities to minister, to serve, to help. Let's keep going. Starting in verse 16, 
he says. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend of men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. We are to maintain, point number two, his mind. These are rules of engagement. This is how we interact with people out there. We're to maintain his mind. Not my mind. I'm going to give them a piece of my... No, they don't want a piece of your mind. And besides that, you need all the mind you got. Don't be giving it away. You need everything you got. It goes for me too. I'm not trying to be mean, but you get the point. We, we can't afford to be giving people a piece of our mind. We're to be maintaining his mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. First Corinthians, but we have the mind of Christ. Peter says, arm yourself with the same mind as Christ. We're to maintain his mind. We talked about that in this, the beginning of this, this study, this chapter, renewing our minds. We do that by spending time with him, getting to know him. But in a moment, I'm going to describe him. And I wonder, do we really love him like we say we love him? Are we in love with an image that we've made up of him? Amen. So he says here in the first part of this verse, don't be partial. Don't be partial. Be of the same mind one toward another. Now, versions are split on how this verse is translated. Many of them say, be in harmony with one another. But others say have the same respect one for another. And this morning, I'm going to go with that one. Be of the same mind one toward another. If you look at different people differently because they are different in different ways, you are not behaving in the mind of Christ. Well, I, I, when I, where I grow up, growed up, they, they, mm -mm. His mind. Well, that ain't the way I was raised. His mind. Well, when I was a kid, they used to. His mind. Well, lately, that group of people have lost their mind. His mind. They're trying to destroy our country. His mind. Do you know that Jesus spent the same amount of time with the woman at the well that he did with Nicodemus. In chapter four, he took the same time to sit down with a woman who was living in adultery. She had had five husbands. The one she was with was not hers. She was there at a time when most women were not there because most women didn't trust that woman. But he spent the same amount of time sitting at the well talking about her salvation as he did in the chapter before of John, John chapter 3, at night with Nicodemus. Same care. He didn't treat Nic oh, Nicodemus. Oh, brother Nicodemus, come right on in. But we do that. James talks about that. James dealt with that back in biblical times. This one guy shows up and he's all poor and everything. You say, he's sitting here on my, my, my footstool here. You, 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 we, got a place, we got a place back there in the back and that people don't have to smell you, and you. But nowadays, if we see a guy on Sunday wearing a suit, we assume he's a Christian. He shows up with a Bible in hand. We assume he's saved. Matter of fact, if, if we're not careful, we'll throw him on the deacon board. Jesus didn't do that. God is of no respecter of persons. Just this morning, the Holy Spirit convicted me. I've been studying this. He sh I was doing something and he said, that's what you're going to be teaching today, Gordon. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Lord. Change my heart, Lord. Deal with my heart. Don't be partial. He treated the woman at the well in John chapter 4 the same as Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He spent the same amount of time. He sat at the same table, the same table with John on his bosom and Judas who was currently stabbing him in the back. 
He didn't treat either one of them differently. Ooh. On the cross, on the cross, he was concerned there on the tree with the future of his mother, the same as he was concerned with the future of the thief. He says, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And then he says to the guy to, next to him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Be of the same mind one to another. When a human being walks up to me, they are created in the very image of God. I must never forget God loves that person as much as any other human being on this planet. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks they came up on. It doesn't matter what color they are, what their social status is, how much money they have, how dirty they are, the sins they've committed. We have the same mind one to another. These are rules of engagement. What would happen? If every person I meet, whether the manager at Publix or the little girl sweeping, what if I treated both of them the same? What if I talked to both of them the same? What if you go to work tomorrow and you greet, I don't know, if you work in the medical field, you greet the doctor the same as the custodian. You treat him no differently because God doesn't. He's of no respecter of persons. He doesn't look at that white coat and go, oh, that's doctor. No. Oh, look at her. She's scrubbing a toilet. Poor little thing. No. He loves them both the same. Hmm. Be of the same mind one of another. Then he says this. Mind not high things. Ooh. There went our social media. <laughs> this is a selfie moment. Aren't you jelly? Look where I am. And I'm not saying we can't do that. I do that too. But, it, but you get my point, right? We mind high things. We, 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 we like people to think, oh, oh, ah. My child's prettier than your child. My puppy's prettier than your puppy. Right? My vacation was better than your vacation. Don't you wish you were here? Yeah. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Let's talk about a low estate, can we? Let's talk about Jesus this morning. You want to spend some time talking about the one we love, the one we worship, the one we follow. Maybe this would be a good refresher course on what that one was like when he came. We mentioned Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God... Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Oh my goodness. I don't even think Jesus would have social media unless he was going to use it for ministry purposes. Once again, I'm not telling you don't have your social media. Use it. Use it, right? It's, it's a discovering an opportunity to interact with others that you may never even be able to interact with otherwise. But the purpose, right? The motive of why we do what we do. He made himself of no reputation. Jesus didn't go about saying, hey guys, you better recognize who I am. And he took upon him of all the forms he could take in humanity. He didn't take king, didn't take boss man, didn't take rich ruler, servant. Servant, servant, Lord, we're, we're, we're stuck with the disciples. Let's talk about being the greatest. Let's talk about being the greatest. Jesus says, okay, we can talk about being the greatest. I'm glad to have that conversation with you. If you want to be greatest, be the servant of all. They, they were like, what is the strange thing he's to be the greatest, to be the servant of all? To, to, to be greatest, he said, to be the least. What? First place, don't come in last, Jesus. Or does it? 
the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Well, then what's the point in competition anyways? He says, if you want to be great, he puts it this way too. Be a child. If a child walks into the boardroom, most of the people in the room get aggravated. They're definitely not impressed. Nobody stands up. Oh, oh, well, come right on in here, young lady. We're so glad to have you amongst us. No, it's more like, who let her in here? Sally! Yeah. But Jesus says, if you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be great, become as a child. If you want to be great, be the least in the room. Condescend to men of low estate. Jesus says, if you're invited to a banquet or a wedding, don't go sit at the upper spot. He says, because you might be in somebody else's seat. They might be somebody bigger than you, better than you. And the good men come to you and say, oh, sorry, sir, you got to move. This ain't your seat. He says, it'd be better for you to sit in a low place and then be told, oh, no, 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 no. We would rather you sit up here. But we, 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 we want high things. We want high things. But the Jesus you serve and follow this morning. Hmm. Let's talk about him. Can we talk about the nature of Jesus? Can we really bring it down into where we live? Let's try this. John chapter 1 verse 46. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Whoa, wait a minute. You mean my Savior grew up on the wrong side of the track? Yes, he did. He didn't come up in a gated community. Nazareth. Nathaniel says, you, you lost me when you said Nazareth. Can anything good? Oh, yes, something good can. And the best did. Came from Nazareth. But we would have never, like Nathaniel, equated greatness with Nazareth. There are areas of this town you won't drive through. I was talking to someone the other day about a certain place. They asked me, Where, do you know about a such and such place? I said, oh, yeah, I know about that place. When I was in insurance business, I was the, the new kid on the block. And so they gave me all of those kind of places. I put on my little suit, my little briefcase, and I'm going, going to this person's house and that person's house to collect a little monthly premium for the life insurance. Oh, yeah, I know about those places. That's some wonderful people in those places. And a lot of people drive by them and think nothing good. Nothing good can be up in that court. Up in those arms. That, that, that community's got walls around it and razor wire. There ain't nothing good. How about this one? How does this man know letters having never learned? So not only did he grow up in a bad neighborhood, he didn't go to their Ivy League schools. He didn't go to their seminaries. He wasn't trained by them. <gasps> Are we still impressed with him this morning? Mm. Are we still impressed with him? He, 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 he wasn't that impressive Whoa, Gordon, that's blasphemy. Whoa, no, no, wait, uh, don't, don't, don't throw stones too quick. Isaiah says, there's no, he has no form nor comeliness. And there's no beauty that we desire of him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. Hmm. This is my Jesus. And yet I'm trying to, Climb to the top of the social ladder. I'm trying to be with the cool kids. I'm trying to get my name on the roster. I'm trying to get my jersey. But that ain't what my Jesus did. And that, are, that is not the rules of engagement. It's not the rules of engagement. How about this one? The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath no place to lay his head. He was homeless. Your savior was homeless. I knew, 
I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of amens this morning. We're talking about the nature of Jesus. We're talking about the rules of engagement. We're talking about maintaining his mind. Because my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If you want high things, mind not high things, he says. If you are going to mind high things, mind his high things. The most high things. And they have nothing to do with social status. They have nothing to do with where a man lives or lays his head at night. It has nothing to do with where a man was educated, if he was educated. But it doesn't set right with us, does it? It doesn't set right with, with, with Western mentality. But this is what has corrupted and is corrupting the church of Jesus Christ in these parts here. Some of our brothers and sisters across the world, they're not struggling with the stuff we're struggling with. They're not. Because they don't have what we have. But we struggle with it because, well, and these things are... The Jesus that we serve. The Jesus that we serve. We need to get back to seeing him for who he is. And knowing him for who he is. Because I think that's one of the reasons we don't act like he did. Because we've got an image in our mind. We've churchized him. We've westernized him. We've Americanized him. And he is none of those things. And as a result, we see things in ways we shouldn't. And we see people in ways we shouldn't. And we just size someone up from a distance. And we, like the Levite and the priest, we beat feet to the other side of the street. Because we don't want to get nowhere near that guy. He got issues. And I ain't got time for his issues. But it was the good Samaritan that Jesus praised. Who looked at that man, even though he wasn't the same nationality. Even though he didn't worship like he did. Even though he had nothing to give. But he saw a man that God loved. And Jesus said, that's how you're to be a neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Them Democrats, your neighbor. Every last one of them. Those Republicans are your neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing when I start seeing things the way that God does. When I start having my mind renewed. And now my life can be about people. Because that's really what service is about. Because that's what his heart is about. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus does. Condescend of men of low estate. One of the few times that Jesus even describes himself, if he were going to type out a tweet, if you will, if he was going to post something on his Facebook, this is what he says, I am meek and lowly. Jesus, we got to talk to you about your marketing strategy. I mean, if, and his brothers even did this, didn't they? They called him aside and they said, hey, look, look, no man who wants to be seen hides himself. They said to him, you need to get out there, man. You need to promote yourself. Jesus didn't do that. But you'd be hard pressed this morning to find a soul who has never heard his name. They might not know anything about him, but they've heard his name. Mm. This will preach. It might not aim in in some circles, but it'll preach. Condescend to men of low estate. Then he says, be not wise in your own conceits. This is the last of seven times this phrase is in the Bible. Seven being the number of completion or perfection. You think God's trying to say something to us? Can I paraphrase it this way? Gordon, you don't know as much as you think you do. 
You ain't as smart as you think you are. I got it figured out, and all y'all's the dummies. And don't look at me like that because you think the same way. But those are not the rules of engagement. And that's one of the reasons my, my heart can't beat for you. Because I look down to you. That's why I can't have the conversation God wants me to have with you. Because I'm better than you are. Because I don't do the things you do. Truth is, I do my own things. And they're just as bad as what you do. That's what Paul's already taught us, right? In the center section of this study. Be not wise in your own conceits. Because it's not about me. My household is not about me. It's about me serving my wife and serving my children. This church is not about me. It's about me serving the sheep of this church. My neighborhood, my street is not about me. It's about me being a neighbor to those people who are living around me. This community, this city is not about me. This country. Watch it, Gordon. It's not about me. The world doesn't revolve. The universe doesn't revolve around me. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recognize that you're just a speck on a little speck in the middle of the universe. Spinning. Seemingly out of control, but it's not because God's got it right in his hand. Let's get to the last point. This is good stuff. So we're to manage their moods. We're to maintain his mind and we're to master his methods. To master his methods. Here's the first one. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Recompense no man evil for evil. I've heard it said like this. Jesus said to turn the other cheek, but he didn't say what to do after that. So you got a knuckle sandwich coming. Now, I believe in self-defense. I believe I can make that argument biblically. That's not our conversation this morning. We're talking about recompensing evil for evil. We're to live purposely. Purposely. What is my purpose on this planet? My first purpose is is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. And my second is likened to it. Love my neighbor as myself. Who is my neighbor? We've already established that. Whoever is next to you, whoever is in front of you, whoever's in the room with you, whoever lives on the street or the block with you, whoever's in the church worshiping with you, who's ever in the grocery store with you, whoever is next to you at the red light, behind you at the red light, or in front of you on the highway. Get out the way, you! <laughs> I'm to love my neighbor. I'm to live purposely. I'm not to recompense evil for evil. I'm going to give you whatever you get. I'm going to meet you where you meet me, brother. No. That's not how it works. That's not biblical. That's not the rules of engagement. That's not what it means to live purposely. That's reacting and far too many believers are reacting. We go on social media. Oh, yeah. How dare she say that? I'll show you. <laughs> Take that. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Give you three examples real quick as we move on. We've got a few more points to make. We'll start with Abraham and Lot. Abraham is the father of faith. The father of faith. He's the man that God called and started this whole thing with. Him and Lot had a lot of stuff. Their herds began to grow and their flocks began to grow and there, there, there began to be contention and strife between their herdsmen. And Abraham, as we read it, says this, you listen here, you young whippersnapper. God didn't call you. I didn't invite you. I don't know why you're here anyway. You need to hit the road, Jack. No, but that ain't what my Bible says. I was just checking to see what your Bible says. My Bible says... Let there be no strife between us, for we are brothers. This is the greater saying to the lesser. 
This is the stronger speaking to the weaker. Let's not have any strife. He could have easily said, get out of here. Get out of here. God didn't call you, no way. But he didn't. He says, Lot, listen. You pick whichever direction you want to go in. I'll take the leftovers. Abraham, no! If you let him choose, you will lose your place. Really? No, that's not how faith sees it. Whatever you choose, I'll take what's left. Because Abraham in faith understood that it wasn't Lot's decision. Recompense no man evil for evil. You don't have to get in that exchange. There's something more powerful than that taking place. Your place is secure. God has already chosen your place and nobody can move you from it. Let's read a little further. Joseph and his brothers. God gave Joseph a dream, man, a good dream. He doubled that dream too. And he was excited about that dream. And he made the mistake of sharing that dream with people who weren't into him. Remember we, we talked to her earlier about there are people who are for what you're for and they're against what you're against, but they're not for you. Be careful sharing your dream with people who are not for you. And they're just for what you're for because somebody else will come along that's for what you're for more than you're for it and they'll run off with them. Or there'll be someone that they're against and once that enemy's defeated, they're gone. And so he shares his dream with his brothers. You guys know how it goes down. They sell him, throw him in a pit. His life ends up in slavery. He's falsely accused. He ends up in prison. But at the end of his life, he ends up the prime minister. And now he's in a position to recompense evil for evil. If there was ever a man on planet earth who had the power and the means and the authority to pay someone back, it was Joseph. Because not only was he second in command to Pharaoh, Papa died. So now you don't have to worry about disappointing Papa. Jacob has passed and his brothers come and say, hey, our daddy said before he died, be merciful to us. And he looked at them weeping. His heart broken that they would even think such a thought. He says, you meant it for recompense to no man evil for evil. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Joseph understood that his purpose in life, his dream, it wasn't over because people didn't accept it. You don't have to worry about anybody taking your purpose or thwarting your purpose in life. You don't have to recompense evil for evil because your place like Abraham, it's secure in the Lord. Your purpose like Joseph, it's secure. One more example before we move on, David and Saul. God rejects Saul as king. He goes down to Jesse's house. He has Samuel anoint David. But David spends years and years and years and years on the run, a fugitive. He's anointed king, but he's not on the throne. Saul hunts him down like a dog. And he has two occasions, two occasions where he could take matters into his own hands. He could end Saul's life. He could end it all. All the fugitive, all the running, all of it could be over and I could finally be what God wants me to be. I can finally take, listen, take, listen, my position. But this is what he says. I will not touch God's anointed. Saul, the anointed? No, he was Saul, the rejected. That was from God's perspective. But David wasn't God. And he didn't look at men like that. He was a man after God's own heart. He still saw and respected God's anointed, his anointing on Saul. He says, men, listen, he'll either die of old age or something bad will happen to him or he'll lose his life in battle. God's going to have to do it. I'm not going to do it. 
I'm not going to recompense evil for evil. My position is secure. And in God's time, listen this morning, say your place is secure. Your purpose is secure. Your position, whatever it might be, no matter who challenges it, it's secure in Christ. You don't have to recompense evil for evil. You can just rest in the Lord. Amen? So live purposely and don't let people change that purpose. Love your neighbor. Then he says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Live praiseworthy. Live a praiseworthy life. So no matter where you go, oh, Gordon, yeah, I know, great guy. Gordon, oh, yeah, yeah, he's that pastor that, yeah, I, I've heard good things. Oh, yeah, I, I work with his son. Wow, I, praiseworthy, honest. That's the way we ought to be living our lives. A praiseworthy life. We're never going to reach people out in the world if we live like them. I had one of my multitude of stepmoms one time. She come to me in my grandmother's house in her dining room and says, you know what you need to do? You need to go to the bar and sit down and have a couple of drinks with your dad and share the Lord with him. <laughs> nope, that ain't what I need to do. <laughs> nope. Homie, don't play that. I didn't do that. But I tell you what I did do. I continued living a life honest before that man. I continued loving that man. I continued not recompensing evil for evil. And as time went on, his heart was changed by the Lord. Because he saw, even though he did me wrong, I stayed by his side. Even though he did this and said that and went here and went there, I didn't. And through my life, he saw Christ. That's what God wants us to do, to live not only purposely, but praiseworthy, praiseworthy. He goes on and he says in verse 18, if it be possible as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. To live peaceably. Oh boy. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. That's a piece you finna get. Live peaceably with all men. I can only do that because God done whipped me for that. So I, I'm no better than nobody in this room. Y'all read some of my posts in 2020. So, so, I mean, I'm not looking down on anybody. Matter of fact, I'm the chiefest among you. Some of you have never even came close to some of my burners. But that's not the peace that he's talking about. That's not the rules of engagement. Live peaceably with all men. All means all, and that's all, all means, even that one somebody. Ooh. Hmm. Yes, love that one that you'd rather hate. Amen. That's what Jesus is saying. As much as life within you, if it be possible, I'm glad that is spoken that way because I've had some people in my life that I found it wasn't possible. And some of you need to hear that. Some of you this morning are heartbroken because you've done everything you know to do to save a relationship. And it hasn't worked. And you feel guilty because of it. Let this truth make you free. If you have a clear conscience before God and man, if you have done all you know to do, if it is possible, as much as life within you, live at peace with all men. If you've done that, God does not hold you accountable for what the other person does. Let's just talk about that real quick as we're flying by. A relationship, yes, is twofold. It's a back and forth. You really can't have a relationship one-sided. But as it pertains to the rules of engagement, as it pertains to how I'm going to answer to the Lord, it is one-sided. It doesn't matter what you do. I've got to stop worrying about what you do and how you do it and what you say. And if you receive it, if you like me, if you're nice, if you're kind, it doesn't matter. These are my rules of engagement. My Lord, my master tells me, his servant, as I'm serving, how to engage with you. And it doesn't matter. I'll never forget that lesson that I learned in my marriage. Jesus says, Husbands, love your wives. And there's no if after that. 
You ever notice that? There's no, husbands, love your wives if she's lovable. Love your wives if she cooks for you, if she cleans for you, or irons your clothes, or whatever she does. Love your wives if. There is no if. It's love your wife, period, punto. That's it. And you know what? My wife changed when I started doing that. Not really. <laughs> what I realized was it wasn't her problem. I was the problem. I wasn't engaging in the marriage the way that he instructed me to. But our marriage changed like that when I finally submitted to the Lord and said, Lord, by your grace, by the power of your spirit, I'm going to love her no matter what. And these rules of engagement, that's what it is. This is what I do for you. It has nothing to do with what you do back. But see, we're worried about, we're, well, but what, what? And, and I hear people, all, and I do it too. Oh, but he, it's what I'm doing. This will set you free, dear saint, if you'll accept these rules of engagement. Because you'll stop living your life reacting to what other people do or don't do. I smiled at her and she didn't smile back. I'm not smiling at her no more. That's it. I'm done. It'll be the last smile she gets from me. Really? Come on. I'm going to smile at you and you can scowl at me. I'm going to smile at you again. And the next day I'm going to smile at you. And I'm going to wave to you. And I'm going to greet you. And I'm going to hold the door open for you. Well, I'll hold the door for everybody except for Sister Spookenbacher. She had the nerve. I told her what dress I was wearing to the women's Christmas party, and she went out and bought the same dress. <laughs> if it's possible, as much as lieth within you, here's what the Lord is saying. Gordon, I want you, I expect you to do everything you can to live at peace with those people. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. But it's not fair. It's not fair that I, I make peace with them. It ain't my fault. I didn't do it. I shouldn't be the one to have to give in. I shouldn't have to be the one to say I'm sorry. It's a good thing Jesus didn't have that attitude with you. It's a good thing he didn't wait for me to come along and say, Lord, I would like to make things right with you. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. These are rules of engagement. This would change our world. We, we, the church is looking to politicians. How foolish are we? We need a good, good politician. And I'm not saying we don't need good politicians. I'm just, but we think they're going to be the ones that change the world. Do you know that we've been commissioned for that? Amen. That's the church's calling. Right. We're supposed to be setting the standard. We're supposed to be the example to the world. Oh. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't trespass. Don't put your hands on something that belongs to God. It's above your pay grade, dear saint. Anger, bitterness will destroy you. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It is a slow, agonizing, painful death. <laughs> there are people who won't speak to each other today and they can't even remember what started the argument. <laughs> Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Oh, we love that verse, don't we? I've heard it. Oh, I'm going to kill him with kindness. Ever heard that? That's a misinterpretation of this verse. Heaping coals on it. I'm going to kill him with kindness. 
I'm going to smile at them, but on the inside, I want to wring their neck. That's not what that verse means. In biblical times, it wasn't like our times. We don't think anything about fire. We just go turn on the stove, or, and there's fire, fire, fire. Whew. We don't even get impressed anymore, right? I watch a guy on YouTube, he goes out and he does things out in the wild. And he, every time he builds a fire, he steps back and he goes, we have fire, baby. You know, he, he builds that fire and he's excited about it because it's a big deal out there. But in biblical times, they didn't have big lighters. I carry one in my backpack everywhere I go. Not because I smoke, but hey, instant fire. I can go, ooh, look what I did. <laughs> fire. In biblical times, it wasn't that easy to start a fire. It took effort. It took work to make a fire. And so if your fire went out, you'd take a clay pot and you'd put it on your head and you'd go over to your neighbor and you'd ask your neighbor, can I borrow a few coals from your fire? And your neighbor would give you a couple coals to put in that clay pot. Heap coals, not just one here. Let me fill you up with coals. Let me warm you, dear neighbor, dear brother, dear enemy. Now, there may be some burning that takes place as they walk away from my house, from your house, from our house. Burning conviction, that is. As they make their way back to their house, recognizing that's my enemy. Who just gave fire to warm me and mine. Last verse. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Live purposely, live praiseworthy, live peaceably, and lastly, live powerfully. Have we forgotten the power of good? Amen. Have we, church? Have we forgotten the power of good, doing good? Our God is good. He's a good God. We even said God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Well, then shouldn't his children be good and do good? It was said of Jesus by his community. He went about doing good. These are rules of engagement. And I hope this morning you've been challenged, convicted, most importantly, changed. Because if we'll start living like this, we'll change our world. And if you say, well, I'm not really ready for the world yet, fine, start at the house. Start here. When that world sees Jesus in us. It'll change everything.